Hello, everybody. This is John Allen, and you are watching Last Week in the Church, the show where we pan through the flotsam and jetsam, the torrent of news of the Vatican and Global Church beat from the last week, looking to extract those few gleaming gems of gold, those few nuggets of news that you really need to have. Here's what we've got for you this week. We begin with white flags and white hot anger. Once again, comments by Pope Francis on Ukraine have stirred a hornet's nest of reaction. In this case, not simply from Ukraine itself, but really across the range of Ukraine's allies, particularly in the Western world, and not simply in Catholic circles, but also from civic and political leaders as well, up to and including the President of the United States. We'll examine what the Pope said, what the reaction to it has been, and where that leaves us. Second, this week, we've got a crisis averted. Also, once again, Pope Francis has come through an apparent health scare with seemingly flying colors. He has, after battling what Vatican described as light flu-like symptoms for a week or so, he has resumed his normal schedule and appears to be good to go. We'll explain why Pope Francis would seem to have some gas still left in the tank. Third up this week, we've got more fallout from Fiducia. So this week, the Coptic Christian Church in Egypt, the Coptic Orthodox Church, which is the largest Christian community in the Middle East, has announced it is suspending its dialogue with the Vatican over the Vatican's recent document giving approval for the blessing of same-sex unions. We'll examine what the cops have said and how this illustrates a kind of paradox about ecumenical relations. Fourth this week, we've got the wrinkles to reform. So over the weekend, the Pope gave an audience to a Belgian bishop who has been accused of covering up clerical sexual abuse, actually had to renounce Pope Francis's granting of a red hat, that is, Pope Francis's invitation to become a member of the College of Cardinals, to short-circuit a mounting controversy regarding his record on clerical sexual abuse. We'll explain how this illustrates one of the enigmas about trying to make sense of Pope Francis when it comes to the reform effort. And then finally this week, we have the Catholic Cincinnatus. We will look back at Pope Benedict XVI's historic resignation on what is the 11th anniversary of the election of his successor, Pope Francis. All that and more is waiting for you on this week's edition of Last Week in the Church, so please stay where you are. I will be right back. This is our official Last Week in the Church infomercial, because I come to you with a special offer for all of those would-be Catholic eggheads out there. That is, if you're the kind of person who likes sounding smart, who likes creating the impression that you know things other people don't, that certainly describes me. If that describes you, you're going to want to know about this. Now, I've already spoken about this new app, this new online resource called Magisterium AI. Basically, what it allows you to do is to type in a question like, what does it mean that the Pope is infallible? Or what does the Catholic Church teach about the environment? Or, you know, whatever. And it will give you a short, smart, easily digestible answer based on more than 5,000 official magisterial texts. But recently, these guys have created a new feature on the app. It's called the Scholarly Mode which draws not just on official texts, but also the best and brightest of Catholic thinkers and theologians over the centuries, from Augustine and Aquinas to more contemporary figures. And we'll also give you a very quick answer about what those folks have had to say about what the church teaches on various issues. Now, I promise you that if you try this once, you're going to wonder how in God's name you ever lived without it. It's brought to you by our friends at Longbeard. They are the digital marketing design company that provide the IT backbone for Crux. They provide the same service for a slew of other Catholic organizations and outfits. They are they're brilliant, and they are creative, and they are tremendous. And I'm kind of out of adjectives at this point, which is saying something, because I traffic in adjectives. But I am telling you, these people are the absolute level best. So. Check it out. This is Magisterium AI, their new scholarly mode. You're going to dig it. Magisterium.com, that is Magisterium.com. It comes with my personal guarantee. (laughs) 
All right, everybody. Happy Wednesday to you. Normally, this show drops on Tuesdays. We are a day late this week. I was traveling last week. I was in Chicago for a couple of speaking gigs at the University of St. Mary of the Lake, University and Seminary of the Archdiocese of Chicago in Mundelein. Quick shout out to those folks. I had a great time with you. Thank you for having me. But anyway, we are a day late this week. I hope we will not therefore be a dollar short. We begin, oh, and just a reminder, today is March 13th, and therefore it is the 11th anniversary of the election of Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio to the papacy as Pope Francis. And I think, listen, lots of things are debatable in the Catholic Church. I think the one thing you can say without any fear of denial that is a strictly completely metaphysically objective statement is that there has not been a dull moment for these last 11 years, and there ain't a dull moment this week. So let us begin. We begin with white flags and white hot anger. So Pope Francis, on Saturday, an interview, well, portions of an interview with Pope Francis were released by the Swiss broadcaster RSI, basically meaning Swiss radio and TV in which, among other things, Pope Francis discussed the conflict in Ukraine. Now, let us be clear. The Swiss broadcaster RSI released portions of this interview. However, the full interview is not going to be broadcast until March 20th. So we are now operating off of partial impressions. But in the excerpts from this interview, which were released on Saturday, Pope Francis was asked the question, is it time for Ukraine to embrace the white flag, that is to embrace surrender, or would that simply be legitimizing the position of the stronger party? In response to that, Pope Francis said, well, look, you know, you might think that the white flag is an act of cowardice, but indeed, I believe that the white flag can be an act of courage, the courage of negotiation and that often it is actually the stronger party who was willing to embrace the idea of negotiation. He went on to say that when you see that you have been defeated, that things are not going well, then you have to have the courage to negotiate. And the suggestion being that it was time for Ukraine to acknowledge that things were not going well on the battlefield and to change course and embrace the idea of a negotiated settlement to the conflict. Now, understandably, this did not play particularly well with, to begin with, with the Ukrainians themselves. There was an an immediate firestorm of reaction. Later on the day, later in the day on Saturday, Vatican spokesman Matteo Bruni issued a clarification in which he made the point that, first of all, The phrase white flag was used by the interviewer, and the Pope was simply picking it up from him. So it was not the Pope who introduced the concept of the white flag, meaning effectively surrender. And further, Bruni insisted that if you want the full version of what the Pope thinks about Ukraine, you have to look at what he said on February 25th, which was the day after the anniversary of the Russian invasion in which the Pope called for a negotiated settlement leading to a just and lasting peace, okay? So this was the Vatican's attempt to sort of pour oil on the waters. Unfortunately, it didn't really seem to work because negative reaction continued to roll in. It's almost too numerous to mention, but just to give you a sense of the highlights, the Ukrainian ambassador to the Holy See put out a tweet statement on social media essentially saying, white flag? Nobody suggested waving a white flag in the face of Hitler during the Second World War, and nobody should be suggesting a white flag now. The Ukrainian foreign minister said, folks, we already got a flag. That flag is blue and yellow, and that's the only one we're ever going to fly. We have no interest in the white flag. And it sort of rippled out from there. So you had, for instance, the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, saying that, basically speaking, that surrender is not peace, that surrender would not mean peace in this situation. It would simply encourage Russia to engage in other acts of aggression and said that, you know, Russia is the one that needs to stand down, not Ukraine. Prime Minister Olaf Scholz 
in Germany said comments essentially along the same lines. The foreign minister, sorry, the defense minister in Germany went on national television Sunday night to say that she found the Pope's comments inexplicable. Meanwhile, the leader of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, Major Archbishop Sviatoslav Shevchuk, reacted immediately. He was actually in the United States for a meeting at the time that this interview broke. He said that Ukraine is exhausted, but still standing. We are wounded, but not defeated, and that there is no room for surrender in this conflict. Later, Major Archbishop Shevchuk, in concert with the other Ukrainian Greek Catholic bishops, put out a statement reiterating this idea that surrender is folly, because they said Putin is not interested simply in tactical advantages in this conflict, but he is looking to exterminate Ukrainian national identity, Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian history. And in that context, there's, you know, no room to simply wave a white flag, roll over, and play dead. And, I mean, I could go on, but perhaps for Americans, it is interesting to note that a spokesperson for the White House was asked about the Pope's comments, to which the response was that President Biden joins Pope Francis in praying for peace, but believes that that peace can only come when Russia renounces its unprovoked and unjustified invasion of Ukraine and withdraws its troops from Ukrainian soil. All that leads us to Monday of this week, when, number one, Ukraine summoned the Vatican ambassador to Kiev. This, of course, is what a country does when it's really in a snit. It summons the ambassador of the country it's mad at for a kind of taking to the woodshed session. And after this meeting with the papal nuncio, that is the papal ambassador to Ukraine, the Ukrainian foreign ministry put out a statement in which it said, number one, Ukraine was very disappointed in what the Pope said. Number two, that the Pope's position will simply encourage Russia to continue violating international law. Number three, that the Pope should be supporting the victory of good over evil. And that number four, if the Pope wants to address an appeal to stand down to somebody, it should be addressed to the aggressor in this conflict, i.e. Russia, not to the victim, i.e. Ukraine. Also, on Monday, the German Bishops' Conference put out a statement in which it described the Pope's formula as unfortunate and said, essentially, that the Pope owes an explanation to the Ukrainians, called upon the Vatican to issue a clarification. Odd, since the Vatican already put out, I guess they want the Vatican to clarify their clarification. But in any event, the German bishops also said that it is up to Ukraine to decide when the moment to negotiate has come. Oh, and I should have added that Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky also put out a statement in which he said the real church is the one that stands with the people in the trenches, not the one that proposes negotiations thousands of kilometers away from the front lines. An obvious sort of slap, what the Pope had to say. The only party in all of this that seemed to have anything positive to say about the Pope's comments was a spokesperson from the Kremlin, perhaps unsurprisingly, who said that they took the Pope's comments to be addressed at the Western powers which this Kremlin spokesperson said are seeking to exploit the conflict in Ukraine for their own strategic and tactical interests, uh, said that has been a great mistake, and they essentially applauded the Pope for acknowledging it. Where does all this leave us? Well, look, let's be clear. There is no doubt about the Pope's humanitarian sympathy for Ukrainian victims of this war. He never opens his mouth in public and hasn't since February of 2022 without calling for prayers for what he describes as martyred Ukraine. That said, the Pope simply is not a Western, he does not see the Vatican as a Western power and does not see himself as a Western leader. He is not simply going to echo the line of NATO or the White House or the other Western powers. As I've said in this show before, substantially his position is closer to say Brazil or India than it is to Washington or Brussels. And this is another chapter of his refusal to be enlisted in the good guy versus bad guy narrative with regard to the conflict. Basically, he sees Russia as a superpower pursuing its own interests, but he sees the United States of the other Western powers in exactly the same way. He has said before he doesn't believe there are good guys and bad guys in this conflict. This is another example of him taking essentially that position. Is that going to play well in all quarters? Certainly not. Is the Pope about to change it? Wouldn't seem so. All right. Second up, 
this week. We've got a crisis averted. So as you know, of late, Pope Francis has been dealing with another bout of bronchitis, or what the Vatican describes as light, non-flu-like symptoms, which have rendered him unable to do a few things. He has had to not cancel, because as I've said before, popes never cancel anything, but suspend various engagements on both his public and private calendar. Also, on other occasions, he has showed up for meetings, but rather than reading his prepared text himself, he has entrusted that task to others. And he has, at various points over the last couple of weeks, appeared in public seemingly fatigued, worn down, and just, you know, not at 100% capacity. Nevertheless, over the, the past few days, we have seen a pope who seems to have pretty much staged a full recovery. On Friday, we saw Pope Francis go to the parish of Pio Quinto as Pius V here in Rome for his 24 Hours for the Lord initiative, a kind of Lenten observance that, among other things, promotes the sacrament of penance. While at the parish, the Pope heard confessions from nine individuals. By the way, he spent about a half hour doing that. Do the math. That means each of those confessions lasted about three minutes and 20 seconds. Obviously, these people had been prepared to be brief because most pastors will tell you that most penitents, after three minutes, haven't finished hemming and hawing and clearing their throats before they get to what's actually on their minds and hearts. But this was a brisk exercise of the sacrament, but nevertheless, of course, remains fully sacramentally valid and, you know, indicates the Pope's commitment to the sacrament. He also read his homily for this occasion in his own voice, even gave some prepared, well, I'm sorry, some extemporaneous remarks, riffing on one of his standard lines, which is that God never gets tired of forgiving us. It is we who get tired of asking for forgiveness and said we shouldn't do that. Then on Saturday, he had a very busy morning, a number of audiences. On Sunday, he delivered his traditional noontime Angelus address, once again in his own voice, in a voice that seemed clear and strong and resonant. And all of this indicating that the Pope seems to have weathered the storm. As I have said on this air before, here's where we are vis-a-vis the Pope's health. We're talking about an 87-year-old who's got a series of difficulties, all of which are cumulative, but none of which are life-threatening. We are in a moment where he's probably going to go through periodically these cycles in which he has to pull back, power down, cut back, and he's going to have an alternation between good days and bad. Over time, of course, the balance will shift progressively in the direction of the bad days. However, how long that's going to take to play out is anybody's guess. And in the meantime, this seems to be a pope who believes he has miles to go before he sleeps. We'll keep an eye on it at Crux, obviously. Okay, third up this week, more fallout from Fiducia. So this week, the Coptic Christian Orthodox Church in Egypt announced that it was suspending its theological dialogue with the Vatican in response to Fiducia Supplicans. That was the December 8th document from the Vatican's Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, which essentially authorized Catholic priests to deliver blessings to couples who were involved in what it somewhat euphemistically described as irregular unions, which most prominently, of course, would include couples in same-sex unions. Now, while the Vatican and the Pope himself have insisted that this marks no change in church teaching at all, that church teaching about marriage remains completely intact and unaltered, and that this is simply about the kind of pastoral accommodation to sinners who are looking for the medicinal mercy of an ecclesiastical blessing, it has nevertheless generated ferocious reaction. Of course, there has been tremendous reaction from within the Catholic world. But in addition, there is now also mounting reaction from some of the church's ecumenical partners. We talked last week about how the Russian Orthodox Church had commissioned a study of fiducia supplicans, a study which concluded that fiducia supplicans was a sharp departure from Christian moral teaching and that this conclusion was shared unanimously by the members of the Russian Orthodox Commission. The leader of that commission described the document as a kind of shock, which he said was going to set back ecumenical relations. And most recently, this week, the largest Christian church in the Middle East, the roughly 8 to 10 million strong, 
Coptic Orthodox Church in Egypt has announced a suspension of its relationship with the Vatican over its objections to fiducia suplicans and what it perceives to be the kind of moral approval of homosexuality that is inherent, as they would see it, in this text. And this, of course, is an especially bitter pill for Francis to swallow because he, up to this point, was seen as a great apostle of relations with the Copts. Of course, it was just last year that Pope Francis made the decision to add 21 Coptic Orthodox martyrs who had been beheaded by ISIS on a beach in Libya in 2015. He added them to the Roman martyrology, making this really the first time, unambiguously, that the Catholic Church had recognized non-Catholic martyrs as saints worthy of veneration in the Catholic tradition. The Pope has also met Pope Tuadros of the Coptic Orthodox Church, And so prior to this point, there was a sense that Francis had made real progress. And now, of course, all of that is at risk. And I would just note this. This, All of this illustrates one of the real political ironies, if you like, of ecumenism, that is the press for Christian unity. Generally speaking, ecumenism is a progressive cause in the Christian world. That is, it tends to be Catholic liberals, for instance, who are most interested in mending fences with other Christians and saying, look, you know, a lot of the fault for these splits is on our side. We need to reach out. You know, we need to clean up our own act and make nice and try to, you know, mend fences. And in other Christian churches, it's the same thing. It tends to be mainline Protestants, more progressive, who are more interested in ecumenical relations. It often tends to be evangelicals and Pentecostals and the Orthodox particularly the more conservative strands of orthodoxy, for whom it can sometimes be a tougher sell. And yet, ironically, that same progressive instinct that can lead many Catholics to embrace the ecumenical cause can also sometimes paradoxically work at counter purposes with that ecumenical cause, particularly in relations with those more conservative expressions of Christianity. Because the more that the Catholic Church is perceived to be embracing progressive positions, in this case on the blessing of same-sex unions, the more that can create new heartburn, new consternation in ecumenical conversations, again, particularly with groups such as the Orthodox who often have more traditional theological and liturgical positions. In other words, it's sort of the paradox of unity, right, that the same logic that can lead many Catholics to want unity and to press for it can also lead them to adopt positions that sometimes do not necessarily promote that spirit of unity. You know, we will have to see all this, how all this plays out. Okay, fourth this week, wrinkles to reform. So if you look at Pope Francis's public calendar for this past Saturday, as I mentioned, it was a very busy morning for him. But one of the meetings on that schedule was an unannounced and to this point unexplained audience with a retired bishop from Belgium by the name of Lucas Van Louis. Now, if that, name's, if that name seems familiar to you, it should. And here's the reason. In May 2022, Pope Francis announced that he was going to name Van Louis a cardinal. Van Louis had been the Bishop of Ghent in Belgium from 2003 to 2019. He was retired. He was going to turn 80 in September. So this was, in effect, one of those honorary cardinal appointments. But, you know, Bishop von Louis is somebody who is very much in the spirit of the Francis papacy. When one of his brother Belgian bishops at one point had publicly suggested that AIDS was a form of divine punishment for homosexuality, von Louis was very forthright in condemning that position. He has been a big supporter of the process of synodality launched by Pope Francis. He has called for a more participatory process of identifying and approving candidates for the priesthood, saying it shouldn't just be clerics involved in these decisions, but laity should have roles as well. So very much a Pope Francis kind of guy, and therefore you can understand why the Pope might have wanted to give him a red hat. However, von Louis very quickly was compelled to ask Pope Francis for permission to refuse becoming a cardinal because Van Louis was also and remains a very controversial figure in Belgium 
because of his track record on the sexual abuse crisis. It has emerged in recent years that at one point, when he was the Bishop of Ghent, the diocese paid $25,000 to a victim of a priest in the diocese. And obviously, they made that payment as a kind of admission of guilt, but von Louis failed to inform civil authorities that this priest was still in active ministry, and perhaps the most galling of all, that he was in the Democratic Republic of Congo running an orphanage for Rwandan victims of the genocide. There were a number of other cases in which Van Louis was later forced to acknowledge that complaints against priests had been made while he was the Bishop of Ghent, that he did not report to the police, did not report to the civil authorities. He said he thought those cases were not urgent because the priests involved were already retired. Nevertheless, a clear violation of the church's new protocols on these issues. And so as a result of all of that, Van Louis had become a very controversial figure, and most observers believe that his request not to accept the Pope's offer to become a cardinal had been motivated in part by pressure from his fellow Belgian bishops who were feeling the backlash of public outrage about all of this and wanted to sort of short-circuit the controversy. The question all of this raises, of course, is how in the world was the decision made in May 2022 in the first place to announce that Bishop von Louis was going to become a cardinal without any effort to address the inevitable controversy that that was going to raise? I mean, you might say, well, maybe Pope Francis knows something that we don't. Maybe Pope Francis thinks that von Louis got a raw deal. Perfectly fine, but you can't just, you know, pretend that there is no controversy. You have to address it, right? You have to say, by the way, this decision may generate surprise in some quarters because of the controversy around Bishop von Louis, but here are the reasons the Pope believes it's appropriate. None of that happened. To this day, by the way, we don't know if there was any kind of canonical process launched against von Louis. It could be that that was the reason that the Pope and von Louis met on Saturday. We don't know because the Vatican hasn't said. And von Louis, therefore, takes his place on a list of enigmatic cases when it comes to the Pope's response to the clerical sexual abuse crisis. Yes, he has promoted reform at many opportunities. Yes, he has adopted new legislation intended to create a culture of accountability. And yet there is the case of ex-Jesuit, Father Marco Rupnik, the muralist and acclaimed artist who stands accused of the sexual and psychological and spiritual abuse of more than 20 adult women ranging over decades. There is the case of Argentine Bishop Gustavo Zanqueta, who is currently serving a prison term in Argentina for the sexual abuse of seminarians, four and a half year term to which he was sentenced in 2022. He's now on house release. And yet, while all this was unfolding, he was brought to the Vatican by Pope Francis, given a position of financial stewardship at the administration of the Patrimony of the Apostolic See invited to Vatican events such as the annual Lenten retreat, and by all accounts, sort of treated as a close intimate of Pope Francis, despite these charges against him. In other words, Van Louis is a reminder of the question marks and unfinished business that surround the Pope's legacy on clerical sexual abuse. Finally this week, a quick thought on the anniversary of the election of the successor to Pope Benedict XVI. As I mentioned at the top of the show, I was in Chicago this past week for a couple of lectures on the legacy of Pope Benedict XVI. And what I want to say now is simply this, that I think with the benefit of time, 11 years after the fact, after Benedict's resignation, it has become more clear that at the popular level, the way Benedict left the papacy is what most of us are likely to remember 100 years from now, 200 years from now, 500 years from now. He will be remembered as the pope who voluntarily and in a a selfless spirit of sacrifice to the common good, renounced his powers because he didn't believe he was able to execute them anymore in a way that served the best interests of the church. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, he has become the Catholic Cincinnatus. Cincinnatus, of course, was that ancient Roman who was made a dictator, given absolute power to defeat a foreign enemy. And once his job was done, He handed those powers back to the people and went back to his farm, therefore becoming for all time a symbol of civic virtue, 
in ecclesiastical terms, Benedict XVI now is that symbol of a civic and ecclesiastical virtue whose example will not be dim with the passage of time, just like Cincinnati. So we will see if the state of Ohio decides to create a, a new city named for him, just as it did for Cincinnati. All right, that is our show for this week. As ever, full coverage of all these stories can be found on the Crux site. That is www.cruxnow.com. I hope you have a fantastic and blessed week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I will talk to you again very, very soon.